industry can work directly with organizations to get the facts out there. Practice sustainability. Bringing the facts to the public about the issue. Campaigns. Are they for the greater good or are they deceptive tools that are misused? For the most part, we all know what campaigns are. We can draw on examples in history where campaigns changed the world for the good. The campaign by the Red Cross to donate blood. The campaign to get clean drinking water in developing countries. And the campaigns to advance women's rights have all been extremely important for society. I'm involved in a campaign to change the perception of genetically modified food so that vitamin A enriched rice, known as golden rice, can be grown in developing countries and help save millions of children's lives. Then there are the political campaigns, which are designed to make a politician look like the best choice for the voter. Advertising campaigns make you want to buy the product a company is selling. And there's nothing wrong with that. The voter and the consumer know they're being pressured. But I want to talk about a different kind of campaign. Extremist activist campaigns. I know a thing or two about these. When I helped start Greenpeace with a group of friends, our common goal was to save humans from the threat of nuclear war. So we campaigned around the world. First to stop the U.S. from testing hydrogen bombs in Alaska. And while our protest voyage didn't stop that test in 1971, it turned out to be the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever detonated. We then did the same for French atmospheric nuclear testing at Mururoa Atoll in the South Pacific. This time we not only sent a ship from New Zealand to Mururoa, we also campaigned everywhere from the Vatican to the Notre Dame Cathedral to the first UN Conference on the Environment in Stockholm. Our next campaign was to save the whales from factory whaling fleets that were bringing some species to the brink of extinction. Back then, our campaigns were driven by passion for a cause and bringing the facts to the public about the issue, plain and simple. When I started with Greenpeace, these campaigns were focused on an honest concern for human survival, whale extinction, and really toxic waste. But by the time I left, they had become anti-human, using sensationalism and fabrication to gain public support and, of course, to get the money in. My pleas for common sense and accountability fell on deaf ears. And on January 31, 1986, I drew my last modest Greenpeace paycheck and moved on. Greenpeace isn't alone in this. Many activist groups rely on propaganda, the art of using sensation and bias to persuade people into taking sides on an issue. These groups appeal to emotion and feelings instead of science and logic when crafting their campaigns. Their scare tactics are typically designed to spread misinformation, which hurts many industries and throws hundreds and sometimes thousands of jobs into jeopardy without even a second thought about the damage caused to families and communities. This is an interesting contradiction. The activists say they want to rid the world of something evil, such as forestry, oil and gas, plastics, or the use of genetic science. But these are products and processes we rely on every day, from cars and planes, the wood we build our homes with, the hose we use to water our garden, right down to the credit cards we use to purchase our groceries and gasoline. They treat humans like the enemies of the earth. I want to take you through three examples of how extremist activist groups spread misinformation and pad their campaigns with misleading language, and how these campaigns can damage people, industries, and even the environment itself. The first example is actually one of the main reasons I left Greenpeace. My last straw was their campaign against chlorine. They named chlorine the devil's element and called for a worldwide ban on its use. But chlorine is natural, 
one of the elements in the periodic table. We can't ban it. It's essential for life. It was then that I realized that none of my fellow Greenpeace directors had any formal science education. But what they did have was a sophisticated understanding of the campaign. The decision to ban chlorine for human uses was the first of many Greenpeace campaigns that are not based on science or logic. I was the only director with any education in the sciences, and there was nothing I could do to change the minds of my fellow directors. They believed that chlorine must be banned for the good of the environment and human health. But the entire campaign was based on falsehoods, and the realization that a negative campaign about chlorine could raise a lot of money. Just like those members in Greenpeace who had no science background, the public, who generally speaking have no science background either, would get scared and give Greenpeace money. In today's terms, we call this fake news. You simply can't ban chlorine. It is the 11th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And even if Greenpeace could ban it, why would they want to? Think about table salt. Its chemical name is sodium chloride, and it is an essential nutrient for all plants, animals, and human life. And yes, that includes you and me. The acid in your stomach that digests your food is hydrochloric acid, which contains chlorine. No living thing on this earth could survive without chlorine. But not just that. Chlorine has massive health benefits. Adding chlorine to drinking water was the biggest advance in the history of public health. It stopped the spread of waterborne communicable diseases like cholera and E. coli. So how can Greenpeace call chlorine the devil's element, when in fact chlorine is a gift to humankind? Well, activists in their campaigns tend to look at only one side of the equation when it comes to preventing risks to human health. They argue that since chlorine could combine with organic matter in the water, there is a slight chance a carcinogenic substance may be produced. Activists claim this extremely rare combination might cause one death in a million people over their lifetimes. Put into context, there is a much greater chance of dying by an accidental fall in your garden than what these campaigners are claiming. And it certainly beats thousands of people suffering a miserable death from cholera due to a lack of chlorination. As recently as 1991, there was a serious cholera outbreak in Peru that caused more than 1,600 deaths and made 250,000 people sick. And what caused this? You guessed it. It was lack of sanitation and insufficient chlorination of the water supply. A more recent example in North America was the E. coli crisis in the year 2000, which killed seven people and made 2,300 people sick in a small town in Ontario. An extensive report that contained hundreds of findings said E. coli would not have spread with proper chlorination of the water. I take the tiny risk of chlorine in my water every day, and so do you, and our governments require it for our safety. So why does Greenpeace attack chlorine? Well, it's a scare campaign with a call to action, and parents hear it, become fearful, and send them money. And for what? To ban one of the most important elements for public health, an element that is protecting their children from suffering and disease? Chlorine does so much more than disinfect our drinking water. More than 75% of our synthetic medicines, including many antibiotics, are based on chlorine chemistry. Chlorine is also the basis of vinyl, also known as polyvinyl chloride, or simply PVC. It is one of the most revolutionary and important materials on the planet. Vinyl pipe is the safest material to keep clean water flowing to our homes and our daily lives, and it doesn't decay like iron or lead pipes. While pipes for drinking water, wastewater, and industrial fluids are the largest uses of vinyl, it has a myriad of other important uses. Vinyl is used extensively in construction, 
for windows, floors, decking, fencing, siding, and electrical conduits. One of the most important uses of vinyl is in healthcare facilities. Picture a hospital. Everything from intravenous bags and tubing that deliver medicine to your body, to the vinyl gloves and caps, to the flooring you walk the halls on during your recovery takes advantage of vinyl's inherent antibacterial properties, helping to keep you alive. Just about everything you see in a hospital is made from vinyl because it's easy to sanitize, reduces the spread of disease-carrying germs, and supports the healing process. But Greenpeace calls vinyl the poison plastic because it is made with chlorine. But in fact, vinyl is not poisonous in any way and saves lives every day. It is a miracle material. So what happens with non-scientific propaganda-based campaigns like this? Just remember, propaganda is the art of persuasion through biased language. This approach purposefully spreads misinformation and we see more campaigns and headlines like this one. Phthalates linked to abnormal genitalia in baby boys. Always be cautious when you see the word linked and especially in an activist campaign. What does linked mean? It means nothing has been proven. It's a trick word used by many activist groups to scare you into giving them money. But what on earth is a phthalate? Phthalates are a class of chemicals used to soften vinyl, which is otherwise rigid. We use flexible vinyl products every day. The phthalates they contain are some of the most tested chemicals there are and have been cleared of negative human health and environmental impacts by the highest authorities, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Please make the chemical fear activists accountable for the words and terms they use before parting with your hard-earned money. As a final thought on this campaign, just search the internet for, quote, phthalates linked, unquote, and you will find they are not only linked to abnormal genitalia, but also to childhood obesity, autism, asthma, heart disease, and cancer. Greenpeace names chlorine the devil's element and says we should ban it because it's toxic. But let's follow some logic now. How would we disinfect our water? And how would we kill the bacteria that are trying to kill us? The reason chlorine is the most important element for public health is precisely because it's toxic. The fact is we need toxic substances to survive. We all know that too much of most things can be toxic. Alcohol, table salt, the sun. In fact, the sun is essential for life, while at the same time, it can kill you if you stay in its rays for too long. Maybe Greenpeace should start a campaign to ban the sun. The point is, we all rely on important elements for their usefulness and to the extent that they are helpful to us. Another campaign that has sprung up in recent years is the campaign against the use of vinyl in building construction. How did vinyl, one of the most sustainable, weather-resistant, non-toxic materials on the planet, get on the activist hit list? The USGBC, the United States Green Building Council, started getting pressure from activist groups to adopt an anti-vinyl rule for construction. To their credit, rather than blindly accepting these standards, the USGBC decided to study them. They struck an expert panel in 2002 called the Technical and Scientific Advisory Committee, or TSAC for short. In late 2004, after it had received hundreds of submissions and considered all the available evidence, the committee's draft report concluded, quote, the available evidence does not support a conclusion that PVC, the technical term for vinyl, is consistently worse than alternative materials on an environmental life cycle and health basis, unquote. In other words, it is as acceptable as the other materials in building and construction applications. The committee added that such a simple credit could steer designers to use materials which performed worse over their life cycle, unquote. In other words, by giving vinyl a negative credit, 
builders may choose a material that causes more damage to the health of both people and the environment. As examples, using tar and gravel roofing rather than vinyl roofing, using linoleum instead of vinyl flooring in healthcare facilities, or using iron pipe rather than vinyl pipe. But the result of TSAC's recommendation made a lot of activists unhappy. Like the former Greenpeace activist Bill Walsh, who started a splinter group called the Healthy Building Network, or HBN for short, to continue to campaign against vinyl in buildings. Obviously, no amount of scientific study is good enough for zealots who don't want to give up a good fundraising campaign. Bill Walsh and the HBN work tirelessly to convince architects, builders, and the public that vinyl is poisoning them and their clients. And I keep asking, where's the proof? But more than damaging the vinyl industry, HBN's campaign is detrimental to human health. You see, HBN focuses on healthcare facilities, claiming that vinyl products used in hospitals are harmful to patients. In fact, the reason vinyl is chosen in hospitals is because it makes it easier to maintain a sanitary environment. I have warned of the increased risks of superbugs in healthcare facilities. It is a fact that two million people get infections annually in American hospitals. At least a hundred thousand die from these infections and this adds 30 billion a year to healthcare costs. Vinyl plays an important role in preventing this toll from being more deadly. Campaigns to eliminate vinyl are based on misinformation, sensation and fear, the stock in trade of extremist activists. And the Healthy Building Network isn't alone. The Living Building Challenge from the Living Future Institute has a red list, a list of materials they claim are worst in the building industry. And guess what made the red list? That's right, vinyl. The Living Building Challenge claims that vinyl is a, quote, known human carcinogen, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, unquote. Sounds pretty official, doesn't it? Well, it's not. The Living Future Institute is purposefully misleading the public about the conclusions of the U.S. Department of Health. Vinyl is not a human carcinogen. In fact, it is entirely non-toxic in any way. In the past, industries who found themselves under attack from extreme activists would either hide in shame or try to apologize for what they are doing even before there was proof they'd done anything wrong. But we're now seeing a change of tide, with industry fighting back against the false claims of activist groups. The best example of this is Resolute Forest Products, the largest producer of newsprint in the world. For years, Greenpeace had a fundraising campaign that claimed Resolute was, quote, destroying the boreal forest of Canada, unquote, which encompasses the most northern forests and amounts to fully 10% of the world's forested land. Greenpeace claimed that Resolute was leading the charge in destroying endangered forests and was in violation of the law. Greenpeace also said that Resolute was ignoring the rights of First Nations communities and logging on indigenous people's land without consent. These are all claims that Resolute challenged in a lawsuit against Greenpeace. They filed two suits, one in the United States for racketeering and one in Ontario for libel and interfering with corporate relations. And they got Greenpeace to admit that they lied. Greenpeace said in their motion to the U.S. court that their accusations against Resolute were, quote, without question, non-verifiable statements of subjective opinion and at most non-actionable rhetorical hyperbole, unquote. Can you believe that? Greenpeace admits that what they said about Resolute Forest products was non-verifiable, otherwise lies. But you see, the damage was done. Customers such as Best Buy canceled their orders and the cost to Resolute Forest products was high due to Greenpeace's lies. Greenpeace admits to relying on propaganda, powers of persuasion and hyperbole. The fight isn't over. 
But Resolute Forest products have successfully caused Greenpeace to admit their campaigns aren't based on science or facts. They're based on appealing to emotion. And here's the rub. Most companies won't take activist groups to court. It's a financial burden and time consuming, and the media often sides with the activists. Is there hope to work together with these groups? Probably not. But remember the building group I was telling you about earlier. One of the first green building organizations, the USGBC has a program called the LEED standard, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. They have recently changed their approach to vinyl. They've become open-minded to the vinyl industry. I find this extremely encouraging, that the industry can work directly with organizations to get the facts out there. It's a small step in the right direction, and hopefully other organizations like Greenpeace will start listening. So the next time you see an activist campaign, take a second and think about what you're being asked to believe. What is motivating this organization? Is it the cause or is it the money? More often than not, campaigns are seeking money, so they appeal to donors' emotions. And as Greenpeace admitted in the Resolute Forest Products case, they rely on embellishment, exaggeration, and outright lies to do so. Without campaigns and donors, activist organizations wouldn't exist. They would simply be out of a job. Beware of groups that aren't really looking for solutions to important issues, but are looking for the next target, the next sensational campaign that can wring money out of donors, out of industries, and their employees, and in general, out of society. Think about how you would feel if someone launched a malicious attack on you or your family that was based entirely on propaganda and lies. The people who work in industries that have been unfairly targeted by extreme activists are affected just as much as you would be if you were in their position. So think critically, use your mental muscle, and listen for the facts, not the links. Your life could depend on it. I'm Patrick Moore, the sensible environmentalist.